That was from the Adoramus Hymnal a CD collection for, for the, uh, the hymns of the Adoramus Hymnal from Ignatius Press, San Francisco, uh, made in cooperation with the Church Music Association of America in 1998. And the, the hymn was In Paradisum, and uh, the chant for that. And uh, this is a translation by Richard Divorzo, Divorzo, in 1955. May the angels conduct you to paradise, and at your coming may the martyrs receive you. May they lead you to the holy city of Jerusalem. May a choir of angels receive you, and may you with Lazarus, once a poor man, possess eternal peace. Today is All Souls Day, and we remember the deceased of the world, those who have gone before us in God's grace, and in a special way, those of our families, and also those who were neglected, you know, people who are not remembered, especially those who've uh, suffered greatly, and those who've gone before us who are most in need of our prayers. As the hymn before stated, these holy souls, they suffer resigned in heart and will, until thy high behest is done and justice has its fill. O by the fire of love, not less, in keenness than the flame. O by their very helplessness, O by thy own great name, which was uh, composed by St. John Henry Newman. in the 1880s, I think that was composed. And that's, uh, Lord, help the souls that thou hast made. So now let us greet the Eucharistic Lord by singing the O Salutaris, which can be found on the back of the uh, any missalette within a missalette also. And if you have the Magnificat, they can be found on page 241. Saving victim, open wide the gate of heaven to us below. Our foes press on from every side. Your aid supply, your strength bestow. To your great name be endless praise. Immortal Godhead, one in three. O oh, grant us endless length of days in our true native land with thee. O oh, salutaris ostia. Que celi pandis ostium, bella premunt ostilia, da robe fair auxilium, uni trino que domino, sit sempiterna gloria, qui vitam si ne termino, non bis donet in patria. Amen. This is from St. Therese of Lisieux. O oh my God, I desire to love you and make you loved, to labor for the glory of Holy Church by saving souls here upon earth and by delivering those suffering in purgatory. I desire to fulfill perfectly your holy will 
and to reach the degree of glory you have prepared for me in your kingdom. In a word, I wish to be holy. But knowing how helpless I am, I beseech you, my God, to be yourself my holiness. Since you have loved me so much as to give me your only begotten Son to be my Savior, the infinite treasures of his merits are mine. Gladly do I offer them to you, and I beg of you to behold me only through the eyes of Jesus, and in his heart aflame with love. Lord Jesus, abide with me as you do in the tabernacle. When the evening of life comes, I shall stand before you with empty hands. I wish to be robed with your own justice, and to receive from your love the everlasting gift of yourself. I desire no other throne, no other crown but you. And that's found on page 241 in the November Magnificat. Let us pray. Listen kindly to our prayers, O Lord. And as our faith in your Son raised from the dead is deepened, so may our hope of resurrection for your departed servants also find new strength through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples. On this mountain he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God to whom we look to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us. Psalm 27. From Psalms 27. The refrain, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life that I may gaze on the loveliness of the Lord and contemplate his temple. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Hear, O Lord, the sound of my call. Have pity on me and answer me. Your presence, Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I believe that I shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord with courage. Be stout-hearted and wait for the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I believe that I shall see the good things of the Lord in the land of the living. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For Christ, while we were still helpless, died at the appointed time for the ungodly. Indeed, only with difficulty does one die for a just person. Though perhaps for a good person, one might even find courage to die. 
But God proves his love for us, and that we, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we are now justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath? Indeed, if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, how much more, once reconciled, will we be saved by his life? Not only that, but we also boast of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are now reconciled, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Just as Jesus died and has risen again, so through Jesus God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be brought to life. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 1 Corinthians 15.22 O God, Glory of the faithful and life of the just, by the death and resurrection of whose Son we have been redeemed. Look mercifully on your departed servants, that just as they profess the mystery of our resurrection, so they may merit to receive the joys of eternal happiness. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Beatitudes. The refrain is, Blessed are they. Blessed are they who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are they who are meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. Blessed are they who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Blessed are they. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Blessed are they. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David. Such is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of chains like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I bear with everything for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they too may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, together with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we persevere, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The word of the Lord. The refrain, I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me 
will never die. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me will never die. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me will never die. God so loved the world that he gave us his only Son, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. This is the will of my Father, says the Lord, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, says the Lord. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Whoever believes in me will never die. Let us pray. O God, who willed that your only begotten Son, having conquered death, should pass over into the realm of heaven. Grant, we pray, to our, your departed servants that with the mortality of this life overcome, they may gaze eternally on you, their creator and redeemer, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. O God, our Father, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and you will give life also to our mortal bodies through his Spirit that dwells in us. Deepen our faith and our communion with those who are with you, those who have left this life. May we aid them with our prayers and may they aid us with theirs. Unite us more fully with those who are struggling in this life, that we may show your mercy and live the beatitudes of your Son. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray to the all-powerful Father who raised Jesus from the dead and gives new life to our mortal bodies and say to him, Lord, give us new life in Christ. Lord, give us new life in Christ. Father, through baptism, we have been buried with your Son and have risen with him in his resurrection. Grant that we may walk in newness of life so that when we die, we may live with Christ forever. Lord, give us new life in Christ. Provident Father, you have given us the living bread that has come down from heaven, which should always be eaten worthily. Grant that we may eat this bread worthily and be raised up to eternal life on the last day. Lord, give us new life in Christ. Lord, you sent an angel to comfort your son in his agony. Give us the hope of your consolation when death draws near. Lord, give us new life in Christ. You delivered the three youths from the fiery furnace. Free your faithful ones from the punishment they suffer for their sins. 
Lord, give us new life in Christ. God of the living and the dead, you raise Jesus from the dead. Raise up those who have died and grant that we may share eternal glory with them. Lord, give us new life in Christ. Lord, hear our prayers. By raising your Son from the dead, you have given us faith. Strengthen our hope that our departed brothers and sisters will share in his resurrection. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. It's such a natural thing to pray for those we love. Not just a natural thing to pray for them while they're with us here on earth, but a natural thing even more in some ways to pray for them when they have gone beyond our sight. And we trust in God's great mercy and love, in the cleansing power of grace, in the purging power of the flame of the Holy Spirit. For we're called to the full life of heaven. Matthew 5, 48 says, Be perfect, or matured, as your heavenly Father is. And it's only then that we will really experience heaven. And that can only come about when we yield fully to God's grace and not hold back, clinging to our sins, however small, or bad attitudes and the like, resentments and things that blot out the light of Christ, not completely, because when it's blotted out completely, when, if we blotted out the light completely, then uh, hell is our, our destiny. But we should never be discouraged in praying for anybody. We should always pray in the presumption of God's mercy. Not only for us, but for everyone. And to aid those who can be aided by the power of our prayers. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Strive for that holiness without which one cannot see God. And that holiness is the very holiness of God that he pours out to us, which we are called to cooperate with. Again, there's no force in this. There's no, nothing's irresistible. But God, who is love, is literally infinitely attractive. James 3, 2 reminds us we all fall short in many respects. And we know God is love, as 1 John tells us so strongly. Revelation 2, 21, rather, 27, reminds us that nothing unclean can enter heaven. So we have to leave behind that which is unclean. So there's not going to be a luggage check when we get there and our luggage be pulled away from us against our will. No, we have to yield up that baggage, which we can do in the power of God's grace. We cannot do that on our own power. There are degrees of sin that are distinguished. We see that also in 1 John, 1 John 5, 16, 17. There are sins which are not deadly, we're told. And we're told also to pray for those who've sinned, but he says, I'm not saying you should pray for those who are mortally sinful. He's not talking about that in this context, although we should certainly pray for them 
as well, especially if we build them here in this life. James 1, 14, 15 tells us, when sin reaches maturity, it gives birth to death. So the maturity of that, it's the reality of this mortal sin that uh, 1 John is talking about. And even in the Old Testament, we have in 2 Samuel 12, 13, 14, David who uh, murdered, who was an adulterer, uh, uh, you can say functionally that all polygamy is adultery, but uh, we definitely know that now. They didn't always know that then. And he sent a loyal servant to his a soldier, Uriah the Hittite, out to die because he had impregnated David, the wife, his wife, the wife of Uriah. And uh, this was pointed out by Nathan, who... who had this prophetic insight into this reality of the sin. But David, instead of killing off Nathan and silencing him, saying he's a traitor and he's a false prophet or whatever, which has sadly often happened when prophets have proclaimed uh, uncomfortable truths, uh, especially about people in power, David repents. But he's told there are repercussions to this. You still have the responsibility. There are repercussions of your sin and that have gone out to others. And so uh, he realized this and that there was, he had to go through this uh, tough conversion. And in Matthew 5, 26, we're reminded in the parable about this man who wouldn't forgive the, his debt, even though his debt had been so forgiven by God, or rather by the king in the parable. And then, so then, uh, he's called back in and said, you will not be released until the last penny is paid. So it's obviously not hell, which is eternal, well, everlasting, that he's talking about. Uh, when, uh, like, unlike what Jesus was talking about in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus with the, the gulf, the uns, you'll never leave uh, that uh, situation that you've made for yourself and uh, cling to. Because even in hell, the people are still clinging to this. They will not yield to God's love. Uh, but that's obviously not what's being spoken of here, of paying the last penny, but rather the reality of what was later labeled purgatory. And Jesus reminds us in 12, Matthew 12, 16, that we'll account for every idle word on Judgment Day. So we should be careful of this. Yes, we're forgiven when we repent, but we still have responsibility for our actions. And we have that responsibility to heal what we have harmed. And no matter how great that harm had been, God's grace is ultimately greater. And St. Paul has this image in 1 Corinthians 3.15 that uh, you'll suffer loss as though through fire, going through fire, but you'll be saved. And that is seen as an, an image, uh, probably, probably the foundational image of, of much of purgatory with the, the fire image of purgatory, which we have to remember is imagery. Because souls, fire isn't going to do anything to souls, one way or the other. Purgatory is a state for souls. And in 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20 and 1 Peter 4, 6, it talks about Jesus preaching to the spirits of the dead, the spirits in prison, uh, especially in reference to those who died 
uh, in the Great Flood, in the, the Noah story there. And uh, if this were just hell, this would not make no, many, any sense at all. Because why share this with them if there's no hope for them? And 2 Timothy 1, 16, 18, Paul prays for his dead friend, Onesiphorus. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 29 to 30, Paul mentions people baptizing for the dead and not saying that that's just uh, absurd. He says if, if there's no resurrection, then it makes no sense. So we may we pray for those who are in need, not just here in this life, but those beyond. And those we know who've gone before us, let continue to ask their prayers as we would have asked in this life. Because the, the bond of love is not shattered by death. This communion of saints that we have is not obliterated by death, but rather intensified, especially through the one death that really makes all the difference, the saving death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his glorious resurrection. So let us now, as we adore the real presence of Christ here in the Eucharist, sing the Tantum Ergo. Down in adoration falling, this great sacrament we hail, over ancient forms of worship. Do our rights of grace prevail? Faith will tell us Christ is present when our human senses fail. To the everlasting Father and the Son who made us free and the Spirit God proceeding from them each eternally be salvation, honor, blessing, might and endless majesty. Tantum ergo sacramentum venere mocernui et antiquum documentum No voce dat ritui, prestet fide supplementum, sensum defectui. Genitori, genitoque, laus et jubilatio, salus honor, virtus quoque, sire benedictio, procedenti abutroque, compassit laudatio. Amen. You have given them bread from heaven, having within it all sweetness. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, who gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death, may our worship of the sacrament of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom. We will live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. the divine praises. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, virgin and mother. 
Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Holy God, we praise thy name. Lord of all, we bow before thee. All honor thy scepter claim. All in heaven above adore thee in Fenet, thy vast domain, everlasting is thy reign. In Fenet, thy vast domain, everlasting is thy reign. Hark the loud celestial hymn, Angel choirs above are raising cherubim and seraphim in unceasing chorus praising. Fill the heavens with sweet accord. Holy, holy. Holy Lord, fill the heavens with sweet accord. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Lord, we pray for the gift of your consolation upon the hearts and souls of all those who have lost loved ones. And we ask that our faith in this communion of saints in the mystical body of Christ, be ever strengthened. Especially as we pray on this day, All Souls Day, for all those who have gone before us, who are in any way need, in need of our prayers. Deepen our communion with them. Deepen our love for all. Deepen our commitment to service in prayer for our deceased and in service of active love for those in need here in this mortal life. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Amen. Well, thanks for all who are watching. Bob O'Neill, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Walter Byrne, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Sean Curtis, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. So now we have our meditation on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Let's see how this holds up. Mm -hmm. This seems to be working here. And today and we're not going in the doing the prayer section of 
the catechism that we've been doing on Tuesdays, or Mondays rather. Uh, but we're doing the communion of the church of heaven and earth as we are celebrating All Saints Day and All Souls Day today. And that's paragraph 954. Paragraph 954 in the Catechism. And it's in part one, the profession of faith, Roman numeral two, the communion of the church of heaven and earth, in paragraph 954. The three, three states of the church. When the Lord comes in glory and all his angels with him, death will be no more and all things will be subject to him. But at the present time, some of his disciples are pilgrims on earth. Others have died and are being purified. While still others are in glory, contemplating in full light God himself triune in one, exactly as he is. That's from... The Documents of Vatican II, Lumen Gentium 49, and uh, referring to uh, the judgment there, the judgment uh, parable in Matthew 25. And it goes on to quote from another part of the continuity of, of Lumen Gentium there. All of us, however, in varying degrees and in different ways, share in the same charity towards God and our neighbors. And we all sing the one hymn of glory to our God. All indeed who are of Christ and who have his spirit form one church and in Christ cleave together. So no matter what divisions and quarrels there may be among the Trinitarian Christians, whether some people like it or not, we are connected. We're, if we're in grace, in God's grace, then we're joined together. And uh, there's someone I know, I can't really call him a friend, but... Uh, he was saying, oh, you Catholics, there's no way you can go to heaven, uh, all of these, uh, this often. And I said, well, uh, I told him, I said, you have to get rid of that attitude of hatred of, of others, and he, which, of course, they don't claim this hatred, uh, that, uh, uh, because he said, you'll be seeing Catholics and Orthodox and Anglicans and other people like that, whom you uh, disdain, indeed despise, going in ahead of you, and you will refuse to go in because you will not go in with them. And so we have to, the, the, as we were, as I was talking about in the, the homily on, uh, or the sermon, I should say, on uh, the, the, the passages from Scripture about the, the purification that we have to go through, that we, that we have to be all pure to experience the reality of heaven because heaven is primarily not a place thing it's not like this great big national park or something where you get everything that you want and you, you know, have unlimited access to soft swirl ice cream or whatever but it's primarily there will be this where we're going to be resurrected bodies this is going to be some place nests and stuff like that and all sorts of of dimensions like that, but we won't be bound as we are by time and space, totally constricted as we are now. But the main thing in it is the state of union with God, and it cannot be unless we give all that up that's holding us back. But we are all united, as we're told, in varying degrees and in different ways, share in the same charity, 
Charity here is caritas. That's agape love. The love that God is. It's not just about almsgiving or something like that. Our, our humanitarian efforts, as laudable as they are, this is about the very love that God is. Towards God and our neighbors. And then this imagery of this grand choir that you find in the book of Revelation. Everybody's uh, singing, it's like a musical, uh, some ways. The beginning of the book of, of Luke is like a musical too, but uh, the Gospel of Luke. And he said, we all sing the one hymn of glory to our God. So the, heaven, there's total unity, not only with us as individuals as God, but with each other. All of the divisions are gone. There's, we're, we're all distinct. In fact, we'll be even more distinct, more ourselves in the reality of heaven than we are here. But there's no separation. There's no division. We will be reflecting in a very pale way that unity that the Trinity is and the distinction that's within the Trinity. Paragraph 955. So that, so it is that the union of the wayfarers with the brethren who sleep in the peace of Christ is in no way interrupted, but on the contrary, according to the constant faith of the Church, this union is reinforced by an exchange of spiritual goods. Again, Lumen Gentium 49. The spiritual goods, it's not like, you know, we're trading, that it's, it's some sort of uh, trading post, celestial trading post, and we're just uh, passing off things, the people on earth passing off stuff to the people who are on the porch of heaven in the, re the reality of the final stages of conversion and in, in, in the reality of purgatory there at the, on the porch of heaven, as I said. That's my favorite image of, of purgatory. But, uh, and the people on the other side of the of the uh, the pearly gates there, no, it's not that sort of thing. But it's this communion, this this union in prayer as we pray for those being who are in purgation who are praying for us, and the saints are praying for us, and we're praying for the intentions of the saints. The saints, please, <laughs> there it is. Number two. <laughs> Uh, pardon me. That woke you up, didn't it? Uh, and God bless you too. So it is that the waif union of the wayfarers, so that's us. We're, the, we're on the pilgrimage. We're the ones passing through this uh, transitory life. Uh, and breath with those who sleep in the peace of Christ, that image there of rest, which is, again, an image so, we, to relate to this reality that transcends our wildest imagining. We need this imagery. We need this. And peace, resting in peace, is, is one of them. Another thing is light, although, for me, light and resting don't go together. Light, uh, you know, wakes you up and, and you can't rest. You have to get sunglasses or one of those masky things to get some rest out of it. But uh, they, those two, eternal rest grant to them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. That image. So, but this is, our unity is in no way interrupted, but on the contrary, according to the constant faith of the Church, this union is reinforced. So this is, we're, those who've left us in uh, being torn from us by the, the, real, the physical reality of physical death, by faith we say that is not all there is. In fact, we can often be closer to people who've gone on now that they've gone on 
than we could in earth, on, on earth, maybe because of our, our uh, failings, or their failings, or both. So now that they've transcended all that, and so that we can be closer, closer to them. 956, the intercession of the saints. Being more closely united to Christ, those who dwell in heaven, this is 956, being more closely united to Christ, those who dwell in heaven, fix the whole church firmly in holiness. They do not cease to intercede with the Father for us, as they proffer the merits which they acquired on earth through the one mediator between God and men, Christ Jesus. So by their fraternal concern is our weakness greatly helped. Again, uh, Lumen Gentium 49. And uh, the word merit can be very confusing, especially uh, to those not from the Latin Catholic tradition. Because the, the only ultimate merits, the only first grade merits, the only quote-unquote real merits, are those of Jesus Christ. And all the others are relative. We're, we're channeling the grace of Christ. Like a canal cut out uh, brings the water from the source. So if Without the source, it's just a dried-out trench. And, and so it is with our, uh, our good, so to speak, our, what we've done. It all has to be related, uh, dependent on God, because it's all by grace alone that we're saved. But that grace works through faith that works through love, as St. Paul says in Galatians 5.6. So there's no division between living faith, living hope, and living love. They're united. So that we have to see that. In, and of course, interceding with the Father for us, they're doing that the same way we are doing it, the intercession with the Father, through, in, with, and because of Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's no... Our direct access to the Father is through, within, and and because of God, the eternal word, who became God of the bridge between heaven and earth, the one bridge between heaven and earth. True God and true man. So their fraternal concern is our, is our weakness greatly helped. So you know, the, the saints are helping us by their prayers, just as we're helping each other by our prayers. Their prayers are stronger because they, they don't have the, the baggage and the limitations that we have when it comes to prayer, it comes to anything. Do not weep, for I shall be more useful to you after my death, and I shall help you then more effectively than during my life. St. Dominic, as he was dying, to his brothers, the brothers, the Dominican brothers, that is, the... I and St. Therese of Lisieux, I want to spend my heaven in doing good on earth. And uh, I, my mother mentioned that to me once, this child, when I, he had this picture of Therese de Lisieux, uh, Teresa Martin, St. Teresa of the, of the child Jesus, uh, there in her Carmelite habit, with the crucifix and all these roses and uh, petals and stuff like that from the roses were falling down. And she said, oh, Therese said, St. Teresa, my mother never called her Therese, St. Teresa said that she would spend her heaven uh, pouring out the uh, rose petals of her prayers and stuff like that on earth. And I was, I must have been six or something at the time, because I had just, or seven, I think it was seven, Yet I just seen this movie at the Somerville Theater on St. Therese, on this, a black and white movie. And 
and I was still asking her a bit of questions about the picture. So uh, that was that. And I, I, you know, being seven, I took it a little bit literally that somehow, you know, there were, if you saw rose petals on the ground somewhere, which I didn't see that much, uh, that, that it was St. Therese who had been dropping them down. They just came down out of the clouds. Uh, but uh, I went to spend my heaven in doing good on earth. So that's what the saints are doing. The saints are praying for us. And if they can't be bothered with us, they know what's going on with us. We know that from the book of Revelation, you know, under the, the saints under the altar, praying so when we will uh, uh, vindicate us, but they're pointing to what's going on on earth. And the Lord says, you know, the quota has to be filled up of people or whatever. And uh, so this, that they know what's going on. And uh, they're praying right there. They're interceding, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, with the Lord to, to act. And the saints are conscious of what's going on here and conscious in themselves. They're not in what is called soul sleep. They're, there's this belief called conditionalism that when you die, that's it. And you're sort of like in a soul sleep. You're this, like, a, you're sort of in a deep freeze. And then the next thing, you know, you die, that's it. Then you close your eyes, you're dead. Then the next thing, you open your eyes, and it's the resurrection. The resurrection to life or not. And then many of them also believe that uh, uh, the, the wicked will be exterminated. Or even people, some of them, the people who don't even agree with them, they say they'll be exterminated. And I was saying that to what is, well, this, is that uh, remotely just that I should be exterminated with the same thing and Hitler and Stalin, we should just all get the same thing? Is that, is there any justice in that? But, uh, but uh, the Catholic Church rejects that and says, no, these saints are conscious like uh, Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration, conscious of what's going on and interacting in a sense with the three apostles there. Peter wants to build three shrines to them right there, to Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. 957, communion with the saints. It is not merely by the title of example that we cherish the memory of those in heaven. We seek rather that by this devotion to the exercise of fraternal charity, the union of the whole church in the spirit may be strengthened, the whole church, not just the church on earth, the whole church. Exactly as Christian communion among our fellow pilgrims brings us closer to Christ, so our communion with the saints joins us to Christ, from whom, as from its fountain and head, issues all grace. So Jesus is actually the the mediator with a capital M, of all grace with a capital A, capital G. The fountain and head from issues all grace and the life of the people of God itself. And that's again from Lumen Gentium, but not 49, now 50. We worship Christ as God's only Son, as God's Son. We love the martyrs as the Lord's disciples and imitators, and rightly so because of their matchless devotion towards their King and Master. May we also be their companions and fellow disciples. That's from the Martyrium Polycarpi. The... Uh, the martyr witness of St. Polycarp. 958, paragraph 958, communion with the dead. In full consciousness of this communion of the whole mystical body of Christ Jesus, the Church in its pilgrim members, from the very earliest days of the Christian religion, has honored the great, with great respect, the memory of the dead. And so the pilgrim members, we are the pilgrim members. This is, we're on the pilgrimage through this life, journeying through this life with the goal of heaven as our, uh, the temple that we're going up to in pilgrimage. Uh, 
Because it is holy and a wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins, she offers her suffrages for them. Again, Lumen Gentium 50, and uh, making a reference there to 2 Maccabees uh, 12, 45. That, it's, uh, that, that, that story of uh, uh, Judah Maccabeus, uh, Judas Maccabee, he was uh, uh, leading the, the fight uh, to defend the people from, basically from extermination of, of uh, the of destruction of the covenant and all of this, uh, that, and uh, killing people who are practicing circumcision and all sorts of things, the destruction of, of the scriptures, uh, the profanation of the temple, turning it into a, a temple for the Greek gods. Uh, which they would have thought, they said, well, what's the fuss? They would have said, it's all the same thing, right? That, uh, and so you should just conform completely to what the king says, who is divine. Uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, that the manifest, what's in man his manifesting his divinity, that they were saying. So, you know, so they, they were, the Maccabees, uh, uh, led, were leading the people in this resistance, and there was a battle, and they found among the dead who had been fighting for this uh, superstitious amulets of the idol of Jamnia, who was a, a pagan, that's a pagan divinity, and uh, so it, this wasn't a mortal sin, this was uh, a venial sin. After And after all, they died uh, they gave their lives for the the way of the Lord. So Judas takes up a collection among the soldiers and sends it to Jerusalem to the uh, newly restored temple and uh, for a sacrifice for them. That, and he said it's fitting a right to pray for the dead. It was a good thing. And he said, but it would be foolish if he was not doing this with an eye to the resurrection. Because there were... Uh, those who did not believe in the res bodily resurrection that say, oh, you'd be rewarded here in this life. So the good are rewarded in this life, and then the bad, well, they uh, are cursed in this life. Bad, th bad things happen to you, it's because you did something bad. If good things do, so you're being rewarded, or maybe you're re being rewarded for your ancestors or something like that. But uh, that doesn't square with reality with life. And so the resurrection was so important, bodily resurrection, that you would be, to be a fully human, you have to be a body as well as a spirit, a soul. So the resurrection was important to them. So uh, praying for that. So uh, in, uh, And that's, uh, that these passages in Second Maccabees are the big reason why uh, many in the Reformation tradition rejected the deuterocanonical books and went along with the Pharisee uh, canon, uh, rejecting these things because of that. Because if they accepted that as scripture, well, there it is very strongly in scripture uh, stated. It, right? and they, and also, Second Maccabees says, intercession of the saints, Jeremiah and the martyred priest Onias. So, um, that because it is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead. Our prayer for them is capable not only of helping them, but also of making their intercession for us effective. So a stronger union here in all of this. So 959, paragraph, in one family of God. For if we continue to love one another and to join in praising the Most Holy Trinity, all of us who are sons of God and form one family in Christ, we will be faithful to the deepest vocation of the church. That's again, uh, uh, Lumen Gentium, but now we've moved from 50 to 51. This one family of God. So in the summations in that from paragraphs 960 through 962, the church is a communion of saints. 
This expression refers first to the holy things, sancta, above all the Eucharist, so we're united in the Eucharist, by which the unity of believers who form one body in Christ is both represented and brought about, Lumen Gentium from Vatican II, three. The term communion of saints refers also to the communion of holy persons, sancti, so sancta, that's the holy things, holy things to the holy ones, to the, uh, the sancti, you know, to uh, the saints in Christ, who died for all, so that what each one does or suffers in and for Christ bears fruit for all. So we're, uh, we're all in this together. We believe in the communion of all the faithful of Christ, those who are pilgrims on earth, the dead who are being purified, and the blessed in heaven, all together forming one church. And we believe that this communion, the merciful love of God and his saints, is always attentive to our prayers. So that's uh, Pope Paul VI, uh, from Pope Paul VI, from his, uh, one of his uh, discourses. On November 21st, 1964. So there's that. For that, that's the that little section on the communion of the church in heaven and earth. And let's ask the Lord's blessing. O oh Lord, we ask your blessing on us. Deepen us as members of this mystical body of Christ, this communion that we have with heaven with all those who have gone before us, and help us be people of prayer and people of service. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh. Anybody new here? Oh. Sean Curtis, Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Janet Marks Grow, out there in California, we're praying for you, all you out there in California. Christ is in our midst, he is and always will be. Bye now.